video is a tutorial on how to use the GT Fiber software. Um, to install the software, I made a different video, but if you've already gotten this far, it, I think that means that that worked. So we have gone into our applications, and again, this is on a Mac OS operating system, but uh, the actual inner workings of the software are the same on Windows. On Mac OS, uh, what we're going to do is start by opening an image. So let's go File, Load Image. That's the only thing you can do under File. Um, and if you downloaded the GitHub repository, which I did, I downloaded it to my Downloads folder. And here's GT Fiber 2 GT2 revision. And there are some example images. There's quite a few example images. Uh, let's use figure 5C. This one is a good example for a lot of things. So we're going to open this one up. It's 512 by 512 dot tiff. It can be, you know, it can be a JPEG, it can be a tiff, PNG, bitmap. I think those are the supported file formats. So we're going to open that up. All right, the first thing it comes up with is image scale. And so it's asking you to enter the width of the image in nanometers with no commas, so just a, a number. Uh, this particular image was a 5 by 5 micron image, so we're going to put in 5,000 um, for 5,000 nanometers. If your image is a really large image, if it's measured kind of on the scale of, you know, millimeters, you you want this number to be somewhere in the thousands. You know, you want this to be, uh, let's say that your image was uh, five millimeters for some reason. You know, maybe you're looking at a different scale of, of fibers. Um, I would still put in 5,000 and then I would treat everything as a micron. Everywhere that it says nanometer, I would treat that as a micron. Uh, you know, there's, I don't really have support for different length scales like that. But for now, we're just going to put in 5,000. Um, that's 5,000 nanometers. So the first thing that should happen if it's successful is it opens up a window that shows your original image. And this is what it looks like. Uh, there's not a lot to do, really, except click these two buttons, to be honest. I mean, the uh, these parameters are defaults that I set through uh, training this on my particular material system. These are P3HT nanofibers. And so if I click Run Filter, I'll just show you what happens. Um, we'll go ahead and do that. So you'll see the result of each filter displayed at the end of every step. Um, and so after running the filter, what we obtain is this image called the skeleton. And so in the skeleton, what's happened is, and you have these nice tools available to you that are part of the MATLAB interface, uh, what's happened in the skeleton image is that we've thinned all the fibers down to a single pixel width. So they're exactly one pixel wide, and that's a really good way to analyze fibers. So the way we got there was through this sequence of filters. Uh, and you can look at those steps because, you know, I, it's entirely likely that for your specific image, the filter settings are not going to just work right out of the box, and they might require some tuning. That's going to be the main point of this video. So if we click on our original image, you can see that's the original. And we can get it back to a regular size. The first step is called the diffusion filter. And what that does is it, you can see it smooths out the fibers. So they're, they're pretty noisy in this one. Uh, and there's a lot of variance in the illumination, quote unquote. The diffusion filter smooths out a lot of that variation and noise and generally just makes things smoother. 
uh, longer diffusion times, so, or sorry, longer diffusion time will make this even smoother, but the drawback is that it will also start to make um, objects that are not fibers be drawn out. Uh, and it'll also make fibers that are, you know, touching each other blend together. So I can show an example of, mm, maybe I won't show an example, it'll just, it'll just take some time. At the end, I'll probably show some examples of bad parameter selection. Uh, these two parameters are the smoothing filter sizes. So you, what these do is kind of spread out what this filter is doing is it looks at a local neighborhood. So let's zoom in on the original image. And it's going to, like right here, OK, we can't go that far. We'll do a box. So it's going to look here and say, OK, there's a strong edge here and here, you know, the edge of that fiber. It's going to use the fact that there's an edge there to inform spots like, like this spot, where it's not really clear what's going on, even though you know, maybe this fiber continues through to there uh, and to there, but just because this one pixel is missing um, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be put together. Uh, so what it'll do is, and, and also you have these kind of bright pixels like here and here, and then dark pixels in between them. Uh, that's a better example. That one might not actually get stitched together, but um, yeah, so you, basically you can see that on the very small pixel level, it's very unclear exactly which pixels belong to fibers, but it uses the stronger pixels to inform the neighboring pixels, and the Gaussian smoothing parameter here is how far that information spreads. Uh, sorry, the orientation smoothing parameter is how far that information spreads. The Gaussian smoothing is just a Gaussian blur, and so if your image is pretty noisy, you can add a little bit of Gaussian smoothing, and that's measured in nanometers. So a 5 nanometer Gaussian smoothing filter, um, and a 5,000, so this is a 5,000 nanometer image, 512 by 512 means each pixel is 10 nanometers, so the Gaussian smoothing width is only about a half pixel. This is essentially no Gaussian blurring. The orientation smoothing is what makes pixels inform their neighbors uh, about orientation. So if this is 15 nanometers, that means that uh, this pixel is going to tell the other pixels that are about one and a half pixels away that they should be oriented in the same direction as that center pixel. And then diffusion time just tells it how long to run this uh, anisotropic diffusion process. The details of that can be found in the Chemistry of Materials paper. This is called an anisotropic diffusion filter. So you can see, let's actually zoom in on one spot and see if it keeps the zoom. Well, it doesn't, so that's OK. There's our original image. There's our diffusion filtered version. And you can see that it's just a lot smoother. We can zoom in on, a, on the same section. And now it's OK. Much more obvious where the fibers were and where they were not. The top hat filter basically just enhances the contrast. So here it's um, we're trying to bring out the ridge-like features of the image uh, to make the thresholding step easier. So the top hat filter, you generally want that to be, this value to be more than the width of your fibers. So here you want them to be approximately the width of your fibers um, and definitely not more than the space between fibers because if you have your orientation smoothing too large, then a fiber over here is going to inform the orientation of you know, fiber way over here, which is just not, uh, that's not useful. The top hat filter, um, you want it to be a little bit larger than the width of your fibers. So the fiber width here, 
you know, it's about, it's very narrow. These are about two pixels wide, which is 20 nanometers wide, um, which is typical for a P3 HD nanofiber. And what we, so we've got this at twice the width, we've got this about at the width, and that works out pretty well. <clears throat> All of these previous filtering steps are in service of the thresholding step. So the thresholding step, there are two options, and this I will rerun the filter just to show the difference. An adaptive threshold is going to look at the area surrounding each local region. So it's going to look at a, a small local region and decide if a pixel is white or black based on whether it's brighter or darker than it's the average of its surrounding uh, you know, region. A global threshold is going to set just an absolute value that above which a pixel is white and below which a pixel is black. So let's go back to the original image and try this with a global threshold um, of 0.45, which is actually a, a pretty good value. But we should be able to see the difference between these two things. So here, there's a thresholding step. Um, and so now you can see that these, there are regions that were dark, they were darker. Um, and so they just, they get removed, which is why I typically use an adaptive threshold. The, re, the only reason you wouldn't want to use an adaptive threshold is if your image contains noise that, uh, so first of all, adaptive threshold works really well on images where the fibers are packed very closely and where there's almost no, there's almost no places where there aren't fibers. Um, but if your fibers are very sparsely packed, I think I have a good example of that that I can show later. Um, if they're very sparsely packed, then you can use a global threshold and then you can, you know, remove some of the noise that gets, that would otherwise be found by an adaptive threshold. You can also remove noise using the noise removal parameter, and that is measured in square nanometers. So 100, 1500 is going to be like 10 by, you know, 10 by 150. Um, so a, a fiber that is 10 pixels wide and 150 pixels long, or a, a chunk in this thresholded image. So we can look at the difference between these two. All right, so you see some little chunks get removed. So like this one down here, let's take a look at the size. And sorry, when I said 10 by 150, that's 10 by 150 nanometers. So that'd be one by 15 pixels in our case. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Uh, just due to the size and resolution of our image, anything less than 15 pixels, any of these little regions less than 15 pixels just get removed. And that is usually necessary. From there, we do skeletonization, which I think I already showed, um, thins out the image to a single pixel width. And then fringe removal gets rid of these kind of like spurs in the skeleton, although that was, I think that's been fixed quite a bit. These are really fine-tuning things that, um, for measuring orientational order, it's not quite as necessary. Uh, they, they really have almost no impact. But for measuring fiber length, they can have a, a pretty significant impact. Um, OK, so this is a good starting point for stitching our fibers, which we now do.
Okay. And that's going to take more or less time depending on your computer and on the resolution of your image. Um, if your image is much, much more than uh, a thousand by a thousand, I would strongly recommend resizing your image. Um, so these are five, this is 512 by 512, and it runs pretty well at that size, but if you go up to an image like, you know, an SEM or TEM that is really high res, it's just gonna, it's not, it's gonna take forever. Um, and image, image processing does tend to take a long time in a lot of cases, so that's not unexpected. Um, but at this size, it works pretty well. So there's four parameters that affect the process that just happened. Um, the step length, the curvature, the stitch gap length, and the minimum fiber length. Um, what happened is we took, uh, if you like, let's zoom in on a really weird region here uh, for both of them. Oh, let's see if I can even find that. Um, let's see. So down there, it looks like that spot. So we'll see how this works. Okay, these are approximately the same. Um, so you can see here, this is just a little bit wacky. Uh, just because you've skeletonized does not mean that you've established a real kind of physical fibrillar structure. Um, and so as is laid out in some of the papers, uh, a fiber is easily described, or is best described, as a sequence of vectors. So if I zoom in on this, I can just keep on zooming in now, and I won't lose resolution because it's just a sequence of points in, uh, in an XY space that is no longer constrained by pixels. And so that's the advantage of vectorization. And so you can see here where these things line up, I think. Um, so I, I'm kind of going by that one being probably right there. This would probably be easier with the original image and not the skeleton. Um, but just for instructional purposes right now, what's happening is <clears throat> the skeleton is being broken up at points where there's very high curvature. So I just I know because I'm I know this material system that this type of curve is impossible with P3H nanofibers. They're not going to make a hairpin turn like that, and so it's going to break that kind of curve. That's what this max curvature parameter is for. Once it breaks down those uh, high curvature segments and gets rid of all the branching points, so you you end up with uh, you know this is probably entirely removed because it's just not this is not a real structure. Um, once you eliminate kind of these convoluted regions, you are left with just the fiber segments, which are the more straight, kind of not contour, not convoluted, not branched uh, strings of pixels. And then those are vectorized at a specified step length. And so the step length here is 30 nanometers. That, in our case, is three pixels because we have 10, 10 nanometers per pixel. So if I were to use this one as an example, um, basically it's gonna make a vector from here to here, and then to here, and to here, and then there, 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 all the way down the backbone of the molecule. And that's what this is. It's just a string of vectors. So that step length determines how many vectors it uses to vectorize a segment. If you use a really low step length, like 10 nanometers or like one pixel, it's going to cause a lot of weird behavior. So, you know, it's kind of, this is a difficult one to set but I would basically go with something that 
breaks up your fiber into segments that are, um, you know, maybe like a tenth of the length of a medium-sized fiber. Really the important part of this is to make it so that each step is short enough that they can make the turns or the curves that you observe in your actual fibers, um, but not so short that it makes the processing time <clears throat> uh, too long. So once it breaks up these segments, it's going to stitch them back together. And I think I can show fiber segments here. Okay, so here's fiber segments, and that shows up in this window down here. And here's stitched fibers. And so you can see it's just generating an image over here to, to put on this axis that some have been stitched together. So let's take a look at some unstitched. Maybe we can find an example here. Looks like right there is going to be an interesting case. So we've got these two and this one, maybe that one. And if we were to look back in the original image, it's likely that one of these two belong together. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I go and stitch the fibers, and it's going to shoot me back out here. Uh, yeah, I think it's that one. So it did end up right underneath this rainbow bar, the color bar. Yeah, it ended up stitching those two together. And it does that using these parameters. So as long as there is less than that amount of curvature, as long as the separation between the endpoints of those segments is less than 60 nanometers, um, it will stitch them together. And so the reason that it picked, the reason that it, the reason that this segment picked that one over this one is because they're about the same distance away from the endpoint here, but stitching these two introduces significantly less curvature. Of course, you don't want to stitch things like that one to that one, and so that's why it's a maximum stitch gap length. And so 60 nanometers in our case is 6 pixels. If these two are further than that away from each other, they won't be stitched at all. And then, of course, we have this minimum fiber length parameter, and that's because even at the end of this process, you can end up with a lot of small fiber segments, and they are usually either noise or kind of remnants of the skeleton fragmentation process. And it can really skew your measurement of fiber length to the short end. Um, so this is something you just kind of have to tune heuristically. Um, so these, I think, are worthwhile to show what happens if I vary them. So if I zoom out <clears throat> and show my stitched fibers here, uh, again, these, are, uh, these were optimized with manually traced um, images. But let's say that I allow much higher curvature. You know, Let's double that to 14 per micron and run the same fiber stitching. <clears throat> what we should see is that it's allowing fibers to make much sharper turns uh, when they've been stitched together. Much sharper turns, yeah. So I guess it actually doesn't look that much different. Um, <clears throat> and part of that is because the stitch gap is still limiting a lot of these things from being stitched. But you can actually see here, you know, now it's, it's letting a lot of these like crossings happen. And in some cases, you might actually want that to happen. Uh, but yeah, it's introduced a little bit more curvature. And overall, this isn't a very highly curved structure. So it's not going to find that many to stitch together in that way. Okay, let's see what happens if we increase the stitch gap length. Let's gonna, we'll go for something kind of ridiculous, like 200 nanometers. So if it finds two endpoints that are 200 nanometers away from each other, it's going to stitch them together. 
and even if there's high curvature. So this is all, it really is all affecting this segment matching and percolation step where it looks at all the segment, um, all the individual segments and scores them against their neighbors using these parameters. Uh, and like I said, if the gap, if the gap is too large, it's no match. If the curvature is too large, no match. Um, if both of those are less than their maximum, and there are multiple potential matches, then it uses a weighted sum of these two scores to decide what to match. Um, since I've let it look at a larger neighborhood by increasing the stitch gap length, it's taking longer to score things. And now we can see that it's put them together in a very convoluted fashion. So yeah, you can see here, um, you know, it's put them all together. What's interesting though is that I think that this shouldn't affect the orientational order too much. Um, you know, this is kind of a ridiculous value, so it'll it'll change a little bit. But if we plot orientational order, um, there's our orientation distribution, so that matches up with what we see, you know, pretty well. Here is this plot of S2D versus frame size, and that's explained in detail in the manuscript. But what it's doing is calculating alignment uh, at increasing frame sizes. So let's say I'm zoomed way in here. At this length scale, alignment's very high. It's almost one. But then as I zoom out, that alignment is decreasing until I get to, you know, about three microns where it's plateaued. Um, so it is, it has a val it has an alignment parameter of uh, 0.8 at this fully zoomed out length scale. But if I zoom in on a three micron segment, which, you know, is about there, that theoretically has the same amount of alignment as the full image because it seems to have flattened out around that point. Um, this parameter A, this quantifies how much of the observed alignment is simply, or could simply be attributed to random fiber packing. So if I, if I were to take these fibers and, uh, you know, randomly translate and rotate them, just pick one up and put it somewhere else and do that for all of them, within the frame of the image uh, and do the same routine where I start at a short length scale and then zoom out, that would produce this curve, the, the purple curve. So even for, since these are very long fibers, uh, at short length scales, they're still gonna have some alignment even if they're completely randomly strewn about. And the fraction of alignment that's not due to that random packing is the, um, gives us this parameter A. So 82% of our alignment is non-random. And then S full here is quantifying the value that this leveled out at. This isn't always what happens. There are a lot of cases where it won't be nicely behaved like this, um, in which case you can just use the final value of the S2D parameter at your largest frame size. But you should also take a larger image. Um, this is just to show, you know, here's our visualizations. And then our fiber length, and it also estimates fiber width, although with AFM that's probably not going to be the most accurate. Uh, here's our fiber length distribution. And so since we've stitched these together really well, since we've applied this uh, stitch gap length of 200, we have some really long fibers and there's not a lot of short fibers because a lot of the short ones are getting involved, becoming involved in the long ones. 
So we have an average length of 1,000 nanometers, or 1 micron. Uh, and rho FL, this is the fiber length density. That's how densely packed the fibers are. It's looking at, um, it's taking a box and measuring how much length of fiber there is per unit area. And so if this is, you know, one to, you know, 10 microns of fiber in a one by one micron box, that will be 10 microns per square micron, which is 10 per micron. And so this has a fiber length density of 7.65 per micron. So that's our length and our width distribution. Oh, right, I was gonna show, you know, oh, you can accidentally close these and they'll come back up. Let's display our original image. That just comes back up by clicking display. Um, our fiber, stitched fibers, you can just click that again and that should come right back up. You can save these, so you can save as and, and save that as a um, PNG. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot that you can do. So let's go back to our regular parameters of seven and I think 60 and restitch the fibers. And so what you'll see, I think, is that the orientational order is very much not affected by this, um, by changing these parameters, but the fiber length distribution is more affected. And that's just, it can be really difficult to estimate fiber length distributions. And there's not, uh, at least to my knowledge, there's not a general solution to this problem. So, my recommendation would be to find, if you need absolute fiber length, you can use Fiber App, uh, Fiber App for manual tracing um, to get really accurate estimates of the fiber length distribution. Um, but if you just want to look at trends, I think this should work, as long as your minimum fiber length is some finite value. Uh, so let's look at our orientational order. That's almost exactly the same, 0.82 versus, uh, or sorry, oh yeah, 0 .7, 0 0.78 versus 0 0.77, and, and I think 0 0.82 is exactly the same. So that's not very strongly affected, um, but the fiber length and width distributions are, yeah, so our average length is now 450 microns, or nanometers, um, and even our fiber length density has gone down a little bit, so those are the those properties it's more important to have an accurate segmentation and tune these parameters a little bit. I'll show the orientation map quickly, except it's slow, so it, it, that means I'm not going to show it. But what this does is it uh, colors the fibers by their orientation. And so if you look, you can see that um, it's going to look like this, but then when it's done, it uh, it rescales it and it looks nice. This can help analyze the kind of oriented domain behavior. So each, not just each fiber, but every segment of every fiber is colored according to its orientation. So these magenta ones are all oriented in the same direction. These blue ones are all oriented in the same direction. And then when they start to curve uh, north, they turn more green. Uh, there is a legend that shows up. Maybe I'll just let it run to completion here. I can push that off over to the side while I explain some other features. So we're going to let that run. Uh, a couple other buttons of note over here are the invert color button. If your fibers are darker than the background, you should use that because GT Fiber assumes that the fibers are lighter than the background. Scale parameters with width. Um, so like I said, when I started using, when I started this image, I put in 5,000 nanometers as my image width. So it's 5,000 nanometers from one edge to the other. Um, that's from left to right, not top to bottom. 
I know sometimes you have images that are not square. Um, hopefully your pixel aspect ratio is square, meaning that one pixel is you know x by x nanometers, not x by y. Uh, I don't know of any microscopy techniques that have rectangular pixels, but that would not work. Um, if you have, but if you have images that are wider than they are long, which I think is common for SEM and TEM, uh, you want to specify the width of the image from side to side, again, not from top to bottom. And if you have a library of images that are of varied width, that's what this is for. Um, because if your image changes size, you also want your filter parameters to change size. Let's say that my image was 20,000 nanometers. Um, a 15 nanometer orientation smoothing filter is not going to be as effective anymore. And so we want that to scale linearly with the image width. Um, I think the noise max area also scales linearly, although you might expect it to scale uh, quadratically because it's a, an area term. I've found that it is better for it to scale linearly. But uh, you can always edit these manually. But it just it can be useful if you just are looking at different sized images to um, to have that checked. And if you uncheck it, then you can go, let's, you know, and let's say that you have like 5,000, 5,500, and 4,500 nanometer images that are pretty close, but not exactly the same. Um, if they're that close, it's probably not worth it to scale, to rescale these parameters every time. And so you can uncheck it. And then I can change my image with, you know, let's say it's 4,000 you hit enter and then it'll run and do the measurements based on the fact that it's 4,000, but it won't change the filters. But if I scale with width and then I click, you know, click here and then click enter, it changes those. So now, you know, that's lower, that's lower. That's a time, so it doesn't scale. That's lower, that's lower. And the rest of these are lower, except for um, curvature, minimum length, and step length. Those generally you should just set them uh, yourself. You can show invert color now. Yeah, we don't want that. So the orientation map finished, and we can just take a look at that. These always look really nice. Um, I don't know why that got, oh, I think it got, if you drag this over here when it finishes, it generates this thing to the right. So if you drag it off screen, it'll you know, generate the color map off screen. So yeah, cyan is vertical, red is horizontal. Um, and then, you know, green and blue and magenta are in between. So that's the orientation map. <clears throat> One last feature to demo here before I wrap this up. Uh, analyzing a folder of images, and we're going to save plots and visualizations. So let's say that I have a lot of images, and I've identified parameters that are working pretty well. Let's go back to 5,000 here. I'm going to run a whole folder of images. And I'm, you know, I don't have a very good example for this. Uh, so we'll go into our downloads, back into our repository, example images, and we'll just run this, even though I think you know, well, there's a lot of these. So I pick a folder, and then I'm going to click, well, let's see. Just for the sake of uh, timeliness here, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to open that up and just make a folder with one image to show how batch processing works. Uh, so we'll go into example images, make a folder called batch, and let's pick a different one here. I think that's an interesting one. So let's throw that in, in batch. And so now I can go back to my app, and we're going to say analyze folder of images, and we, are, we want to save the plots and visualizations. Usually when you do this, you don't need to make the plots for everything. 
you just want the results in the in the CSV file. Uh, so we're going to say analyze and navigate back to our example images. And there's our batch folder. So just click in the folder. You don't have to click on, or I mean, you can't click on anything inside the folder. So we click on batch, click open, save results with file name, no extension, results. Okay. So it's going to run the diffusion filter. And you can watch every single image being processed uh, live on the uh, display over here. And then it'll have a progress bar that tells you what image it's working on at the time. So you can see how long it's going to take. So now it's vectorizing, uh, performing the matching and percolation process. <clears throat> vectorizing the fibers, and then it will do the structural analysis, and it's done. So there's your plots, there are your visualizations, and let's see what it saved. So we go into batch. Here's a folder full of stuff. We've got our uh, plot that shows us the vectorized fibers, fiber length distribution, fiber width distribution, orientation distribution, uh, orientational order, looks good, and the original image. That's great. Let's open up results.csv. Oh man, I don't even have Excel installed in this yet. So this is numbers apparently. Uh, this is what the table looks like. It's giving it some nice formatting here. So we've got our image name. Uh, S full fit is the value of that asymptote. Um, let me just pull that up really quick so we can look at those side by side. So it's going to give you uh, S full. Correlation length is this lambda C. Average orientation is from the orientation distribution. So 179 degrees, it's essentially straight horizontal. Fiber length density, that's from the fiber length distribution. So there's our row FL, fiber length density. Mean fiber length, mean fiber width. And I also dump out S2D at five microns. And a new is that um, fraction not due to random alignment or uh, the pneumatic fraction, <clears throat> which is a term borrowed from Luca Crystals. Okay, that is that's it. That's most of the functionality. Um, Again, you can email email me with any questions, and you know, it. Final disclaimer: it might not work. Uh, it doesn't work on everything. This isn't a completely general solution, and there are definitely cases where uh, things are just beyond the capabilities of this algorithm, um, and that's you know that just happens. So let me quit, and I'll show some examples of that. I think in the, I think it has example images, problematic examples. So I'll show a couple that have really um, caused some major problems. So this one, <clears throat> you can probably see right away why this is difficult. You've got these, everything is you know semi-translucent, highly overlapped, um, you know, big bundles where they're collinear for a very long time. And it, an image like this is just not, we're not quite there yet. Um, so you'll have to do manual tracing on this one. Another example, uh, this one was an interesting example that was close to working. So for orientational order, this one might work, although this wasn't a material, this is just like uh, biological fibers spread out on a 
uh, glass substrate or a mica substrate. And the real difficulty here is the low contrast, um, and especially in this region where you have this big bundle of overlapped fibers. When they get really strongly overlapped, the diffusion filter um, tends to make the edges of the top fibers dominate, and then you lose these little important chunks of the smaller fibers. So this is something that is going to require additional work on the computer vision side. And, you know, even like a deep learning approach would still have difficulty with this because it's not like you can just throw a bounding box around it. Uh, this is actually a pretty significant challenge in computer vision. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, it's not a panacea, but it will work on simpler cases, and especially cases where you have, um, you know, fibers that are packed in two dimensions, not kind of deep three-dimensional structures. And it also works on things that aren't fibers. I think there's been a couple of people who've used it for just general oriented morphologies, where it's a, or, or morphology, a uh, morphology that has kind of a spiral pattern or something that has just oriented contours. And it can be useful for that too. So that's the end of the tutorial. And I hope it works out for you. Thanks for watching.